All right, welcome everyone to the fifth session of the Amalthea campaign. Uh, I just have one very quick announcement. Uh, if you did not already know, uh, starting tomorrow, the Avenger group, formerly the Arcadia group, will be playing. Uh, they are going to be every week, Sundays at 3.15 p.m. Eastern. Uh, more on how Daylight Savings Time is going to work later, uh, but that's future me problem. Uh, there's also the Akagi game, which is set on an Excelsior. Uh, that is going to be Thursdays at 6.45 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that is starting this Thursday. Uh, let's see. I don't think I really have much in the way of announcements. A lot of what I have is like actual in-game stuff. So why don't we go ahead and just get started? Uh, Mirthrin, I believe you have the log to start us off. Indeed I do. Stardate 62885.6. It got worse. Of course it got worse. What we thought was an outpost for the caretaker drones turns out to be a major stronghold. Even if we committed the entire fleet to destroying it, the self-replicating nature of the threat makes it a pointless exercise. Besides, I'm not risking that many casualties. The engineering department believes they have a solution. Deploy a Class II station in orbit around the Marissa's planet of Suathia, then use its computers as the central hub of a sensor scrambling net. It should be effective. From what we've seen so far, the caretaker sensors aren't as advanced as ours. But it would mean we're committing ourselves to this region of space for an extended period. The foreseeable future, in fact. Our fleet's in no shape to explore unknown space without extensive repairs, and if we can't cannibalize the station, we'll have to trade with the Marissa for raw some materials. I'm honestly not sure what the right decision is here. Despite the size of our fleet, we are essentially refugees. And the Marissa might be planet-bound, but their civilization is thriving. Our need is clearly greater. But ordering the fleet to head out and leave them to solve their own problems? It just feels wrong. It's not Starfleet. Now the Admiral is in stasis for the foreseeable future. Apparently his symbiote began to show signs of rejecting the host. Just when I needed his advice the most. I need to at least consult with the other captains, if not direct representatives from the civilian population. Whatever happens in the next few days is going to affect all of us. If I'm going to be deciding the futures of literally thousands of people, I should at least know where they stand on the issue. End log. Alrighty. So, uh, obviously the captain's meeting and the civilian leader meeting uh, are going to be sort of the big ticket items. Uh, but did anyone have any points of order they wanted to address before we jump into meetings? Okay. So, uh, with nothing in mind, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so, uh, I'll explain what's on the screen in a moment, um, but I wanted to be sure. So, at the moment, I have uh, Commander Cam, I have Captain Sim, Captain Panek, Captain Tuzan, and uh, Master Chief Hylong, who is representing uh, Captain Beckett. Uh, did you want, say, Garrick there? Did you want the civilian leaders there? Or is this going to be a, a purely Starfleet meeting? Hmm. I think probably, the civilians would get in the way. Yeah, probably just Starfleet only for this meeting. Okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, you all meet in the conference room. Uh, as you all sit down, uh, Hylong tells you, uh, hopefully I'm not being a bother, sirs, but... Uh, Captain Beckett and his extended command staff have fallen ill. Uh, nothing serious, but uh, they are out of commission. I have been sent in his stead. Uh, obviously, I'm not able to make any command-level decisions, as you all clearly outrank me, but hopefully I will be able to provide the insight that Beckett would have provided anyway. Uh, it's one thing after another. Well, let's get started. All right. So uh, Cam says nothing. Uh, she just sort of sits at the end of the table uh, with a pad in hand ready to record notes of this meeting. So, biggest thing we need to deal with first. Right now we've got a choice ahead of us. Either we set up, either we put down roots here 
side, side with the Marissa and essentially become stationary for the foreseeable future, or we leave them to their fate and head out on our own. The uh, engineering department believes they can use the Class 2 station as the center of a sensor scrambling net that would allow the Marissa to begin expanding into space without the interference of the caretakers. However, that Class 2 station is also our sole source of spare parts for the in, well, a anywhere. Plus, we still have about 200 Romulans in the brig we need to find a planet to put on. Captain, I have my analysis from my engagement with the Karen computers, if you wish to hear it. Please. Uh, Panek will stand up and walk over to the display with his hands behind his back. Uh, as you can see here, we have a a rudimentary scan of the system. Unfortunately, the Ophion, due to damage to stain, was unable to capture a full system, system scan. Uh, but we, however, can confirm that at least five of the twelve artificial moons are indeed caretaker hangars. Preliminary reports from my tactical officers estimates that it would take the entire torpedo reserve of the full fleet in, to be committed in order to destroy these hangars. Unfortunately, we do not know whether or not this is the full power and, and uh, numbers behind the caretakers, or if this is only the, the only system they are in. More troubling, we detected as we were leaving the system that the caretakers were beginning rebuilding project, uh, procedures, dismantling asteroids as we were leaving. So either way, they're going to be a permanent problem. <sighs> Heading in What's... with guns blazing, as the, I'm sure the humans would say, sir, does not appear to be a an option worth considering. We must find an alternative to dealing with the caretakers. Mm. Which means time. What's the civilian population like at the moment? Anyone had people coming forward or concerns being raised? I'm unsure, Captain. I have only just recently returned from the system. Hmm. Aboard the Amalthia. Any word from the Marissa yet? I believe that is where Captain Sim comes into play. Yes, uh, well, the Marissa, I have been personally interacting with the Marissa itself, while well, Mayaxo handles the installation of the various structure and hilt from the Romulan orb. Um, because I am, well, because of my unique uh, biological ability, I've been able to interact a little bit more directly with the Marissa underwater. Um, all everything I've seen so far seems to be they they're comparable to the Federation Earth uh, shortly after founding the Federation. Approximate technology, I'd say the of the NX refit, the Columbia class, warp five at best. Nothing to write home about, but uh, they certainly have some interesting innovation. We could incorporate some of their ideas in warp field dynamics. I, yeah, uh, they are very different biologically than other species I've seen. I'm not sure what else to say. They they are friendly and open. -able. They are, they are aquatic. How they view the world is very different. Us two dimensional. I think I got about 50% of that. Yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, you were cutting in and out there for a little bit. Um, let me very quickly change the servers and see if that fixes the issue. I, I, I upgraded my... I updated my... my I'd have up a little too high. Testing, testing. Yep, we hear you. That sounds a lot better. Yeah. 
Sorry, I had uh, I have not fully shape shifted back to an air breathing. I was still partially aquatic. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> As Sim's body kind of shifts a little bit as a chain Lloyd. Chameleoid. Mm-hmm. Uh I'm sorry, what what did you like need me to repeat, Captain? Uh just if the if the Marissa have made their opinion on the matter known yet. They haven't made any opinion uh known. They they wish to explore move beyond their planet. But I think they understand that this is not our home. They are not, we not wish to impose themselves. As a, as a swimming freely people, they do not wish to shackle anyone to a particular planet. I think they, they find it deeply ironic that for them to be free, we would need to limit ourselves. But uh, they are otherwise friendly and accommodating. They have offered us some supplies and shared their technology freely, but uh, little we give you uh, news. Hmm. Captain, if I may interject. The deck? I think believe we should look at the option of a stationary sensor scrambler, logically. And if we do, you'll see that it does not make sense. If we commit our supplies to building this station, we will have to become semi-permanently stationary with, along with it in order to maintain it and protect it. This sensor net will only go to a certain radius throughout the, uh, the system and nearby system. It will not continue to pre- pre- protect the Marissa should they expand. It will also not prevent us from being harassed by the caretakers once we leave the system. In, in effect, Captain, it's a stopgap measure does not deal with the caretakers completely. I believe we should begin looking at alternatives. From what we were able to gather from my foray into the the caretaker system, we understand that they are completely autonomous. Perhaps if we look into a way of reprogramming them, could be a better option. Mm. Introduce some kind of virus into the system. From what I understand of the readings of the, the skirmish, uh, Captain Pinnock encountered, you were able to send out a signal n- um, not triggering second wave? Yes, we were able to to block their transmission uh, to engage the secondary hangar and its flotilla. Um, that might work on a large scale as well, some sort of communication relays sending up that's much larger on their frequencies. Alternatively, we could do the w- reverse. Um, send out a signal that's call for help or assistance from them that lures them into some sort of trap, perhaps a quantum singularity or other hazardous terrain. These could be effective measures. However, we are unable to guess their current numbers. So such a such a tactic would only viably bring perhaps a portion of their current contingent. Hmm. I remember correctly, their their communication method was extremely long range, using uh, fairly advanced methods that should spread quite a distance, longer, farther than our traditional Starfleet subspace communication. Uh, which suggests they're spread out throughout this entire sector. So we're definitely, so we're probably going to have to deal with them no matter how we approach this. And most likely, they're spread between us and the wormhole. Mm. Well, let's send a contingent down to Swaitha. See see what the Marissa's view on the whole matter is. So uh, Cam actually speaks up and says, uh, Sirs, uh, we do currently have uh, Ambassador Lena aboard. I did have her on standby in case you wanted to talk to her again. That'd be useful. Very well. I will make a note and have them brought in. Uh, In the meantime, uh, Captain Tuzon, uh, not to direct the meeting or anything, but did you find anything interesting during uh, your time? Well, with the main one staying relatively close due to our communications, uh, 
system being down. Uh, we've been using our sensors and scanning through everything. Uh, found some interesting uh, readings. Suthia has a rather large deposit of trilithium under the ocean, which is both good and also adds complications being deep under the ocean. Um, and the gas giant in system has uh, helium as well as some other elements that could come in you become uh handy for the marissa should they want to build something like an nx class ship so uh, this time it's high long who's speaking up uh, high long just kind of nods and says okay well uh that would give us a small source of resource i mean obviously we we don't want to Shanghai, their own reserves. It, it is their planet, but uh, Captain Beckett did want me to make it clear that he was against the idea of a station unless we could find a a source of resources. Now, I'm, I'm not quite sure if this qualifies, but it does sound like a step in the right direction. Captains, trilithium is quite unstable and very volatile. Uh, it can also inhibit warp f f uh, functions. And if introduced to a star, produces a tremendous quantum implosion, as we've seen uh, with our time in the Sabine Expanse and the DMZ. Well, we want to take care of the caretakers. Mm. I do not think going around, solution. going around blowing up suns to take care of them, I don't think is a very reputable response. That might work with my signal to draw them together. We uh, do know that they on. have a base around that one sun. Hold on, not to yeah. interject, but <laughs> I had to fact check myself. Uh, it should be not trilithium, but tritanium. Oh, I like the stuff the spaceship hulls made. Yeah, I was like, I I know that they're both T's, but yeah, there's there's it's supposed to be tritanium, not trilithium. Sorry, Ooh, we're not building spaceships out of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flying to suns now. Yeah. <laughs> Our spaceships are made of cesium and nitroglycerin. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw it into the ocean, the ocean explodes, you know. Sorry, you can go ahead. I just It was very important for me to interject before you got too hot into that uh, line of thinking. <laughs> All right. Well... We'll meet with the Marissa, get their opinion on the matter. Uh, in the meantime, we do need to know what date the civilian population is. They know the... I'd imagine they know the basic details of our situation. We need to know whether they... Uh, yeah. Basically, I need to know whether I'm going to have a bit of a civil uprising on my hands if we commit to longer than ten years. In the, in the Gamma Quadrant. So Cam speaks up again and says, uh, Well, sir, I've also taken the liberty of having uh, Mr. Garrick stand by. Apparently, uh, Mr. Garrick has become a sort of a figurehead for the civilian population. Uh, I think we all saw that coming, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit... Sorry, I'm rambling. Uh, I can have him brought in as well. It's just whether you would prefer the Ambassador or Garrick first. Let's go with the Ambassador. Roger that. And she taps on her pad, and uh, after a couple moments, uh, there's a chime at the door. And assuming you let them in, uh, in steps uh, Ambassador Lena. Uh, Hylong does the proper thing and vacates her seat, moves to the back, uh, lets Lena take her seat. And uh, as Lena... Lena doesn't really sit, per se. She stands, uh, or it's some sort of awkward sort of bow uh, due to her, you know, unique physiology. But uh, she seems comfortable all the same, and she says, Ah, hello, Captains. Uh, thank you for meeting with me. Uh, have you come to a decision yet about the uh, caretaker problem? Uh, that's what we came to talk to you about. Well, bad news first. The caretaker problem is a lot bigger than we expected. Turns out the outpost next door is less of an outpost and more of a stronghold. 
quite frankly, we do not have the raw power needed to deal with the problem. That is is... unfortunate. Uh, It sounds like the moment you leave, they will more or less maintain the status quo. Hmm. Which is what we needed to talk to you about. My engineers believe they have a solution uh, in the form of the Class 2 station. It might be possible to use it to create a sensor scrambling net, which would at least create a small buffer zone around your planet that would they would leave up that they would leave unmolested. However, this then creates the problem that, for the foreseeable future, we will be, in a sense, dependent on you for, well, supplies, anything. As as impressive as our fleet might seem. We are stranded here, and we have no. And what we have represents all our resources. Yes, I I understand the precarious nature of your current condition. I also understand that, at least what I've been able to glean, that building this station would use up much of your reserves. Uh, the Marissa. And this is almost verbatim from my queen. Uh, The Marissa are ready to provide whatever assistance they can manage. Uh, However, uh, it is mostly contingent on us being able to safely make it to space. And I fear that without either Constant Guard or that station and now this sensor net, I do not believe we will be able to provide much assistance. We, of course, would be happy to provide some materials and some trade with you should you choose to leave but i do not want this to come across the wrong way but you will be more or less abandoning us if you do leave us without some sort of a solution and sort of nods at understanding <clears throat> yes ambassador i must impress upon you that this sensor net is not a full solution should your ships leave it, you will again be harassed and harangued by the caretaker. This is true. However, uh, based on our previous encounters with them, our main concern is getting an initial foothold. Uh, while I do not know if our weapons are as advanced as yours, I dare say that if given the opportunity, we may be able to hold our own once we have a couple of ships in orbit and ready to explore. Yeah, but Merthyn probably isn't able to suppress like the uh, slightly wry like oh the oh the optimism of youth reaction. Mm-hmm. I also may interject again at Madam Ambassador Captain. Please. Please. I believe you are unfair, fairly looking for a solution from us. Your issue persisted before the the fleet appeared, and our, our appearance did not facilitate further uh, interactions with the caretakers. Justifiably, it is not upon us to seek a solution. So the ambassador kind of looks at you for a moment, and those uh, those piercing orbs of green just sort of stare into your soul for a moment. And, uh, Panek, uh, what would be your surface thoughts at the moment? Oh, just like a stone wall. Just absolute stone wall. Okay. I'm blocking all that. So, Spoken uh, mental uh, discipline. Exactly. Uh, so the ambassador sort of tilts her head to the side and says, You are perhaps the most guarded one in this room, Captain. I do not know what to make of that. Uh, However, I do see your point. Uh, I don't think there's really an easy way to reply to it, however. It is true that we have been unable to deal with this situation on our own, and we are asking a lot of you. Uh, However, uh, I do believe it would be in our group's both interests to work together.
I fail to see what exactly you can bring to the table, Madam Ambassador. The fleet itself can go other elsewhere to seek resources. We have the capability to mine surface for minerals and refine them. I just do not see exactly what you have to offer. We would be committing a, a, a vast amount of resources in order to build the station as a stopgap measure to protect you and your species. And uh, I, I don't know how much Lena will be sort of paying attention to Merthrin's service thoughts, but like there will be sort of like a service. Well, I mean, we do need help with the, the thing, but he's like trying to keep it under wraps. Okay. Um, so actually, it's not Lena who says something next, it's Hylong. And Hylong almost chuckles to herself and says, Ah, yes, I see why Beckett has so much fun in these meetings now. Uh, Captain Panek, if I may say so myself, I think you're drilling the ambassador a little hard. They have asked for our aid, and it is not our place to second-guess or dress them down. You're correct, Master Chief. However... They are asking very hard choices of us, so they de they deserve us to make as much question as question as much as we possibly can. To do so would be disservice to both ourselves and the and the Marissa. And this time it's the ambassador, and Lena says, "Well, uh, of course uh, we are ready to share our tritanium. Uh, the only way to really get it from the oceans, based on everything that I've interacted with Captain Sim here, uh, we are in a unique position to provide a workforce to mine the minerals. Uh, we are also able to provide uh, food, uh, additional supplies that our planet can provide. And again, we are also able to provide a, a connection back to your, well, I suppose our uh, home, if you think about it in a longevity sort of view. Um, out, out of character, has the Vedic uh, approached Merthrin at all since Skull went under? Uh, he has not, but uh, let's just say that Garrick probably holds the answer to the Bajoran <laughs> side of things. That uh, makes sense. All right, so that's what I'm going to say. Very well. Well, we'll do a little more consulting, decide our best options, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So the ambassador kind of nods her head very respectfully, uh, makes to stand fully upright, and says, thank you all for your time. And uh, Cam does sort of walk Lena to the door, and uh, Hylong does resume her seat, as does Cam after the ambassador has left. Mm. Uh, Merton will sort of go mm. well that does clear things up a fair bit uh, Cam you said Garrick was also on standby uh, yes indeed shall I have him brought in please do All right. so this time there's not a chime at the door Garrick simply walks in uh, like he owns the place and takes a very comfortable seat next to Sim and he says ah yes the captains I'm glad you're all here I take it you're here to ask me about how the civilian populace is getting along. Yes, pe people tend to be a little more guarded of their opinions around someone in a uniform. Indeed, I found the best information is best gleaned while tailoring someone's suit. Well, let's hear the damage. You will be happy to know that... The Bajoran populace, which I might add is typically Bajoran, uh, but the Bajoran in your crew have more or less taken to, I believe the expression is, a pilgrimage, though you stopped their first attempt to travel to Suthia and to settle down, I do believe that they will continue to do so with or without our help or our oh, blessing. Hold, hold on, hold on, back, back up a sec. First attempt? Uh, out of character there, uh, the last um, session where they... I mean, out of character, I know, but um, I don't think Merthrin's actually been brought up to speed. Okay, all right. Uh, so Garrick will say, well, yes, the 
attempt to steal one of your runabouts. Uh, the Vedic. Oh, what was his name, pleasant fellow? His name eludes me for the moment, but I believe your officers handled it admirably in your absence, Captain Murthrin. Sort of blinks for a bit. I'll have to have a talk with this Vedic afterwards. Uh, anyway, so, so, all right, so the Bajoran's uh, opinion on staying is pretty definite then. Uh, what about the rest of the crew? Well, uh, the initial shock of being stranded so far away from home is still seeping in. Uh, however, I will simply state that the civilians were prepared for a deep space uh, assignment, and as such, they are, shall we say, not as vulnerable or, shall we say, oh, what's the charming human expression? Uh, bound to any one place. Uh, wanderlust, yes, that is the word I'm looking for. They have a sort of wanderlust. They are eager to uh, uphold their mission and support it in whatever fashion. Hmm. Mm, makes life easiest for us, I suppose. Uh, um, who, who was it who mentioned the helium in the gas giant? That would be me, Captain. I right, cool. Well, I think the bet, the next course of action while we decide what to do is uh, figuring out just how useful we can be to the Marissa. Uh, the helium deposits in the gas giant. Uh, can we run a deeper survey on those, see how viable it would be for us to mine that. Absolutely. We can send probes and figure out how easy it is to mine and collect that, the helium, and well, as well as the other uh, gaseous minerals that are in the giant. Um, I would also suggest, since the Marissa are equivalent to just after the Federation was founded, that Columbia class, maybe sharing with them the technology from that that is in our computer, considering that is helium is the um, main proponent in their coolant systems from that time that uh, that exchange of information might uh, help solidify the uh, relationship. It would definitely expedite the process or um, process, although I'll sure I'll be getting an airful from Panek about the prime directive. I believe that such technology is sufficiently primitive, if you will, to give to the Marissa. However, we should be guarded on what exactly else we give them. We do not want to throw them headlong into a into a age of technology that they do not quite have a grasp on. As you said, they are currently at the state in which we the Federation was using helium-based coolant. In my opinion, this is okay. Sort of, and Mercer will sort of like blink in surprise because he was honestly expecting Pinek to come down a lot harder on this. Very well then. <clears throat> Meeting adjourned for now, I think. I'll uh, go Captain, to. Oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I believe that it would sufficiently relieve tensions with the Bajoran complement if we were to arrange with the Marissa daily shuttles for the for them to make pilgrimages to the orb. However. However the fact of settling is one that we must instill to them is not up to us, but in fact up to the Marissa. And any Bajoran Starfleet officers would be deserting their positions should they choose to do so. Mm. Uh, if I may... I'll mention... I may. Oh, yep. Uh, so Garrick speaks up and he says, I... perhaps pilgrimage was not quite the right word. When I say pilgrimage, I mean that they are very intent on, shall we say, setting up temples and other sort of facilities on the surface. Uh, they are... Uh, I do not know how familiar you might have been with Kai Win of DS9 fame. I use the term fame lightly. But this whole yeah, situation... Mertheran's sort of hands definitely tense up a little at that. Yeah. Uh, this whole situation reminds me of one of Kai Win's uh, more esoteric endeavors, if I may. I believe mm. the word you're looking for is infamy, Mr. Garrick. Ah, yes, infamy. We should make it very clear to their, the, this group's leader, the Vedic, that 
any such attempts would be un uh, wholly against the Marissa's uh, freedom here. You cannot simply move onto a planet and begin to build temples to, to an object simply because you revere it. You, there are protocols and channels they must go through. I suggest you set up a meeting between the Vedic and the Marissa's ambassador, Captain. Mm, agreed. I'll organize a meeting with the Vedic after this, and then we'll see from there. Captain, could I join you in that meeting, being a Bajoran myself? That's a good idea, actually. Anything else? Out of character, I think, Tuzan, there's one more thing in your notes that hasn't been brought up, and I don't know if you're saving that for later. Oh, uh, I can bring it up. Uh, another uh, thing I would like to mention, Captains, um, our complement of Strata Draco seem to be culminating themselves into a dragon squad of some sort. Yeah, Merthrin sort of raises an eyebrow and looks curiously at Hylong. Hylong sort of shrugs and says, as far as I know, there's only six other Serato Draco in the fleet, and they're all on Captain Tuzon's ship, so it does make some sense. Hmm. They are starting to put together design schematics for a quote-unquote gamma flyer. No, no, I think Mercer had actually sort of like curls up into a smile despite himself. Well, they certainly didn't waste any time. No, these these uh, officers tend to be a little bit more gung-ho. Uh, their leader is uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade uh, Vinleth. Well, so long as they're not commandeering any supplies during the initial phase, I see no reason to uh, spoil their fun. Well, if you would like to talk to them, uh, Vinleth is also uh, on standby, should we want to uh, talk to them about it. Mm. Uh, maybe a little later. Right now I have a meeting with a religious leader. Oh, uh, if I may broach one more subject. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yes, if we are uh, If we are allowing uh, Vajorans into the, the population to visit... Uh, we might want to remind them to not fraternize. I believe that's the word with the the native population. the The Marissa seem to have a very they are a mono gendered people who we produce by a. Uh, it's uncertain how. It's uh, uh, gender is a gray area for my people at the best of times don't understand the binary aspect of it, but so the, um, the, the Marissa are particularly confusing. I wouldn't want any... Uh, I would be hesitant to introduce any Bajoran DNA to their population without knowing how and how that would result. Duly noted. But one thing at a time. Uh, if there is nothing else to bring up, all right, meeting adjourned. All right. So, uh, as everyone uh, walks out, or at least starts to, uh, my first question is: Would you like to have the meeting with the Vedic in this room, your ready room, somewhere else? Uh, the ready room, I'd imagine. Ready room, it is. All right. With Tuzan. Right. With Tuzan. Okay. So, uh, next question I have is: uh, Obviously, Mirthrin and Tuzan are there. The Vedic's there. Uh, is anyone else you want at this meeting? Uh, no. All right, so it'll just be the three of you. All right, so we'll kick you over to the ready room. All right, so uh, the two of you, Captain Tuzan and Captain Merthrin, you get situated in your ready room. And uh, after a few moments of getting situated, there is a chime at your door. Come in. All right. And in steps one Vedic Parabe. And uh, he looks about as smug as his token does. He kind of steps in, looks around, and sees you, Merthrin, and he says, Ah, yes, the captain who was too busy in Jeffrey's tubes to meet with me and had the Admiral do it instead. 
Mirthrin, I believe. I believe. Verdict Pabe. I hear you've been commandeering shuttles. Well, you call it commandeering, I simply call it borrowing. We had every intent to return your shuttle once we had landed. <clears throat> Just a second. <laughs> Be that as it may. Well, let's cut right to it. Uh, what are your intentions with the Marissa? Well, they have a tier of the prophets, which means that this place is sacred to not only my people, but to the prophets as well. Mm hmm. And uh, I'd assume you are aware of at least the broad strokes of the situation we're in. I understand that you're in talks with the Marissa about solidifying our presence here, but beyond that, I do not really care for the ongoings of Starfleet. Hmm. I see. Fedek, if you do not care about the ongoings of Starfleet, why did you choose to join this fleet? I simply noticed that there was a lack of a proper, shall we say, religious representation of our people. Yeah, and Mertheran is sort of like just deferring to Tuzon on how legitimate that claim is. I don't know that there was necessarily a lack of religious presence. Although having a Vedic from the assembly is uh, warranted with this many Bajorans. Indeed. And it was thought best that someone who necessarily or did not necessarily see eye to eye with Starfleet would provide the best foil to this sort of fleet. So here I am. Hmm. I'm going to have to make a note to talk to the Vedic Assembly when we get back. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I keep having to stop to call. So, is this where you or tell me I'm back. not allowed to take my flock down to the planet anymore? Well, quite frankly, that will not be up to us. That will be up to the Marissa. I see. And when will I be allowed to talk with one? Well, within the near future, I'm in fact intending to go to the Ambassador and bring up the possibility of uh, Bajoran visitations. But, uh, Again, I must stress that any and all, all interaction will be entirely up to the Marissa. I will not be influencing them in this matter. I see. Well, this has been a illuminating conversation. Did you have anything else for me? <sighs> yeah, out of character, I'm trying to figure out what else I wanted to tell him or ask him I would just like to t remind you uh, Vedic that not too long ago a uh, species of higher technological advancements descended on Bajor and held us in their grasp for many years I would hope that you would not do uh, run parallels to that situation. Of course not. We are not uh, Cardassians. We are not barbaric. Mithril will sort of raise an eyebrow at that, but say nothing. Oh, uh, Tuzan will go, not barbaric, yet you're willing to steal to get what you want. Vedic just sort of... He does that motion with his hands where he sort of acts like he's been shot in the chest but then motions wide with his arms and says you wound me 
I would think that you would have known that I served during the resistance movement. That is all well and good. However, there are proper channels, as there is proper channels to go through anything, even on the current Bajor. I don't understand why you would want to ignore those channels and take matters into your own hands. He tilts his head to the side and looks at you very quizzically and goes on to say, I take it you are not a very religious Bajoran. Otherwise, you would understand the importance of an orb and the discovery of such in a location that the prophets have guided us to. I am religious enough. I was not brought up on Bajor. I will fully admit that. However, I know that an orb is important and should be held sacred. However, I won't interfere in the runnings of another species in order to get what I want from an orb. Hmm. Well, I suppose we will just have to agree to disagree, as the humans say. And uh, I will pass on your requests to the Marissa. Thank you. And then, unless either of you stop him, he turns on his heel and he leaves. And once he's out, Master will sort of Breathe a deep sigh and look at Captain Tuzon. <sighs> this is going to be a huge headache, isn't it? He strikes me as one that is going to continue to challenge us. <sighs> and this creates another potential wrinkle with staying in the orbit of Marissa for an extended period. And speaking Although... of headaches, uh, finish your thought and then we'll do a speaking of headaches. I was going to say, although uh, it get the favor of the Bajorans if we can get the visitation of the orb, it is mm. important to Bajorans. I know that. Yes. I do hope we can come to some sort of arrangement about that, because uh, I'm certainly not going to endorse any attempt to take the orb. Which is why we should probably have eyes on all visitations hmm. I'll organize a meeting with Lena all right so speaking of headaches uh, we're actually going to uh, briefly cut to the bridge uh, where uh, lieutenant Rizzazzo, uh you're getting a notification on your console that you are urgently needed at the brig if you excuse me I am needed, and I push the button that signals for a relief officer to arrive. All right. So, uh, I'll get your token there in a moment, but uh, what's important is when you arrive at the brig, uh, you see that the entire sort of force field projector array has been shorted out, and it is literally sparking. And unfortunately, uh, the... Commander Nostreen, your Tholian that you had captured from the Romulan ship, is nowhere to be found. There is no trace oh, of the boy. Brig. And uh, oh, the, the guards on duty say, ah, sir, uh, I, it's not good, sir. Uh, seems the uh, the Tholian broke out. Thought we... Hmm. Didn't we make the corridor extremely hazardous to him? Well... You didn't tell us to take away his suit, sir, so he was in his suit the entire time. Hmm. Yeah, no, we wouldn't have taken him out of the suit because we wouldn't have known for sure we could actually keep him alive. Yep, yeah, right. This is not good. It's locked down this level, the adjacent levels. Let's so. call for more guards to reinforce. No one travels alone. Everyone travel in groups of threes. Arm yourselves with phasers. Phaser type two. We're Beware the Tholian of Gévaudan. <laughs> desperate Tholians. Are... Alright, so the way we're going to handle this, uh, mm -hmm. as you search for Commander Nostreen, uh, we're going to do a uh, slightly unorthodox extended task, and by unorthodox I mean we're using a combination that 
rarely gets used for extended tasks. Uh, this is going to be a insight plus security. Uh, the base difficulty will be a three. Your work track will be 12 and your magnitude will also be a three. I'm not very insightful apparently. I would say if uh, Rosazo is more relying on his presence, I could see a presence security, but if you're uh, actively no, I... part of the patrols, insight probably would apply better. I'm going to take the bad one because you called it, so it's All right. you, you're not uh, purposely hosing me. Mm -hmm. It's just accidental, so you can't win every roll. All right. Insight security. I still have a TBD focus. I think he's picked one. Let's see what happens. Lace Ooh, fall where they land. Complication. Ooh. So I'm going to say that you don't do any work on the work track because you need three successes to start doing work. But the complication is uh, as you're patrolling or sweeping through one portion of the deck, uh, you get a sort of weary, uh, bleary sort of call from one of your security teams. And uh, they say, uh, sir, uh, Lieutenant Rezaza, we, we just saw the Tholian at... It knocked us out. Uh, somehow uh, they, they used some sort of a, an energy blast from their suit. Uh, knocked us all out. Uh, they, they were headed towards main engineering, last I saw. I signal down. Main engineering, lock yourselves down. Emergency protocol, alpha, beta. All right. What? what? What's, what's, ha what's happening? <laughs> Intruder. Ah! So, uh, as that happens, give me one moment to get the tokens situated. Uh, but as you get that call, a big old Tholian comes rumbling into engineering. Oh boy. And uh, uh, you do have an action there, Chief. But the Tholian is definitely looking like it's beelining for the warp core. And for reference, you are about as tall as its knee. Yeah, like, right. they're big. So, if I remember correctly, there are force fields and blast shields that can come down around the warp core when there's a, when there's a risk of an overload or a breach. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get to a console and try to set one of those up. Okay. Uh, I will say that this will be a daring engineering difficulty 2. And uh, if you have some form of uh, defensive focus, or if you have some form of uh, emergency measures, that focus would also apply. I have emergency repairs. Eh, it's not a repair, unfortunately. Hmm. I wonder if I could use a determination to get an extra dice then. Well, you could also use it for the two free successes. Yeah, okay. But what value would be would you be calling into play here? Uh, opportunity plus instinct equals profit. The opportunity being to get the 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 opportunity to lock this the warp core down to prevent him the pro prevent him from messing with it, and the pro profit being him not disabling our warp core. Okay. Yes, I will allow that to happen. However, you will still need to roll at least 2d20 uh, to see if any complications crop up. All right, so you get two momentum. And sure enough, uh, you rush over to a console, you enter in the emergency sequence, and force fields and blast shields uh, surround the warp core. And just in time, too, as Commander Nostreen sort of reaches out with one of his hands and sends out a blast of radiation, uh, it's sort of blue-tinted, uh, towards the warp core and it dissipates harmlessly across the blast shields and the force fields and at this time uh, rest of engineering is starting to react uh, but before they sort of come to your aid uh, chief unfortunately commander Nostreen is going to move his hand uh, palm out front from the warp core to you and they will order open it now or you will perish uh, I can't really do that. 
So I will say you have one more action, Chief, before they fire at you. Uh, I will duck behind a console. Okay. Uh, just so you know, uh, you do have at least a Type 1 phaser on you at all times, so you could use that as well. I know, but that's not really the first thing Free Pack would do. I mean, once he gets into cover, he might shoot out from behind it. Okay, so we'll say that uh, getting behind cover is your minor action. You would still have your actual action to act. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll, then I'll shoot at him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to, to get you to, because, yeah, it, as far as I remember, movement is a minor, unless you go, like, long distance. But yeah, uh, if you're shooting at Commander Nostreen, uh, this is going to be a control security, uh, difficulty two, and if you have hand phasers, uh, this would be a focus that would apply. Very nice. So you get another momentum. You're up to three. And uh, you're rolling, I believe, three challenge die for this. Okay. So, uh, you sh pull out your phaser, you take a, a shot from behind cover at Commander Nostreen, and sure enough, you, you do hit Nostreen, but doesn't show any sign of damage. Like, there's not even a burn mark on his suit. I'm going to slap my badge and say, Security to engineering, we have an intruder attempting to disable the warp core. Nice. I'm already on my way. Yeah, so they will arrive next round, but this does let Commander Nostreen get another shot off. Uh, now the good news is you are behind cover, so you do have some cover die, which could apply if he hits you. But let's see if he hits you first. Uh, he does not. Uh, in fact, he hits the console straight out and obviously destroys the console in the process, but didn't hit you, which is what matters. And it is at this point that uh, we will say that Rizazo, uh, you're going to come in from this direction. And you would have... How many security people would you have with you? Uh, probably two. I don't want to get too greedy. Okay. I would have 35 security officers, all with type 3 phaser. So. <laughs> Alright, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend some threat to sort of keep the initiative for Commander Nostreen. And seeing the security people come in, uh, he is attempting to blast you uh, in an area sort of, of effect. So let me roll again. Uh, again, uh, his radiation shot goes wide or it's just not potent enough by the time it gets to you. And I would say it's either going to be Free Pack or uh, Rizazo's turn, whichever one of you would like to act. Oh, please, a security agent, shoot him, please. I don't... Right. You're asking too much of this engineer here. Okay. I'm, I'm going to carefully aim a minor action. Okay. And, and and shoot him, I guess. Okay, so control security, and because you're aiming, you may re-roll one of the die. I also have Deadeye Marksman, in, which means I can reduce the difficulty of one. Oh, very nice. Fitting the wrong thing. I don't want science. I want security. <laughs> I do have an applicable focus. Hand phaser. You do? All right. You get your one success. And I believe you're rolling seven challenge die for your phaser. You get to re-roll one. So, no. Still not. It is indeed seven. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I will say that uh, if you would like to spend momentum here for additional damage or to re-roll those zeros, it might be in your advantage to do so. Yeah, I probably should have used charged. Blah, blah. I just... But, um... We have any momentum? We, I do, I'm going to spend momentum to reroll, let's say, yeah, two dice, I guess. Okay, so you go down to two momentum. Okay, so you're at a grand total of six at the moment. Yeah. 
I'm sure he's got some resistance. We'll see how, how that goes. Okay. So, you do, in fact, uh, land a very well-aimed shot. Uh, we'll say center mass on Commander Nostreen, and this time it definitely looks like uh, his suit has taken some damage. However, uh, he's still kicking. And for his turn, uh, he's once again going to attempt to do that sort of area of effect uh, to knock out the security contingent. So, let's see... Uh, no, apparently he can't roll for anything today. Uh, so again, he uh, fires off a wave of radiation and it just dissipates harmlessly by the time it gets to you. Um, I will say at this point, you could have your security officers uh, attack. And the way we'll handle it is just roll me 2d20 and their target score is a 13. Very nice, very nice. Uh, so we'll say that uh, with them two combined, you can roll me a total of eight challenge die. Focus fire. Mm-hmm. Fire, fire at the left leg. All right, and that is I enough. Wish left leg, there's three. <laughs> well, there's six actually, but um, so yeah, with the combined focus fire. Uh, your security personnel are able to effectively stun and knock out Nostreen, and the effect is immediate. Uh, all six of the legs, which were previously sort of, uh, sort of on pinpoints as sort of like a, a spider, um, they immediately sort of crumple as the commander loses consciousness, and there's a, a noticeable thud as he just sort of falls to the deck. Freepok immediately stands up runs over and kicks him and then goes, ah, my foot! <laughs> <laughs> Someone bought themselves a one-way ticket to a cargo hold. Oh, so. ah, come into my engineering and try this crap. Yeah, see where you're messing with now. So I, have my, I help my guards pick him up and we drag him back to his cell. Or okay. a different cell, I suppose. Okay. With, with an increased security detachment this time. Mm -hmm. uh. So, uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're going to cut back to uh, Mirthrin. So, uh, Mirthrin, uh, at this point, uh, we'll say that you're in your ready room. Uh, you're going over reports. You're trying to figure out where to do something, you know, what to do next. When... You hear a very unsettling sound. And guess who shows up? Just a second. Cat trying to walk over the keyboard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Mercer will sort of like stiffen up slightly as he hears the sound and turn around, look at Q. Yeah. Are you here to solve any of my problems? So for the benefit of both the audio podcast and anyone who has not seen RQ before, uh, Q is played by my uh, character Ignatrix, and she's basically a uh, blue-skinned female, uh, feathery wings on her back, uh, wears her hair up in uh, two twin tails. Uh, her hair color is sort of a bluish-purple-red, and uh, she looks very smug. Uh, she's also in, uh, and, uh, interestingly, she is in Starfleet Blue, and wearing the uniform of a uh, a TNG style uniform that is bearing the rank of a lieutenant. Uh, so uh, as you turn around, yeah, she, she's also like the Q in charge of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is why she's different from the regular Q. That is correct. So uh, as you turn around and you see Q, she sort of smiles in that smug sort of way and says, "Well." Since I've lost my usual plaything in the Andromeda Galaxy, I thought I'd stop in and see how things were. Where is that where charming... Is that? Oh, what is he now? An Admiral? Where is, where is where Mr. Is Admiral here? Skull? Merthrin just sort of looks at her again. Are you here to solve any of my problems? Ah, I suppose that depends on what you qualify as a problem, and oh, if you qualify anything... Merthrin sort you... of starts to walk to go out the door. I, 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 he probably won't get far, but... I mean, she's not going to stop you, but as you start to exit the door, you like the door's open and you get ready to, li ah, and you get ready to step outside. Uh, she says, well, that's no fun. I thought I'd tell you something very interesting that might affect your judgment. No, someone sort of pauses, sort of takes a deep breath. Hmm. <sighs> 
<clears throat> sort of slowly turns around. Let's hear it. Hmm. Well, I thought you might want to know that you're on the precipice of a very important decision. Of course, I know how it all pans out, but let's just say that the decision you make today will be one that affects the Quadrant for t the time to come. Ah, oh, great. As if I didn't have enough pressure already. Oh, and just because I feel like being a cryptic asshole, as you might say, make sure to duck. And then yeah. there's that Metron sound again. immediately does so. Yeah. So as you duck, there's the flash, and she's gone. Of course, not immediately. Hmm. I hope you have fun, he sort of says to the heir. Uh, meanwhile, I have to decide something that'll personally affect several thousand people at the very least. Not that I expect a Q to understand that. The heir is silent. I don't know how Skull deals with her. All right. So, uh, Captain, where are you headed next? Yeah, out of character, you might guess, Mithrin does not like you. Yeah, he, uh, he does not like her one bit. Alright, so the next thing he was going to do was go talk to, uh, Lena. Okay. So, uh, let's see, I have quarters somewhere, uh, yes. So I will, uh, I'll move your token there in a moment. I just gotta find where I put Lena. And we will drag her token onto the board. There she is. Alright, so, uh, you find the, she has been assigned one of the many crew quarters. And we'll say, uh, we'll say on the higher deck, so she's in sort of VIP quarters. And, uh, when you chime at the door, uh, she of course bids you enter. And when you do, uh, you see that uh, the interior of the quarters is technically designed for two people, but uh, for this particular instance, uh, it has been more or less, one of the bedrooms has been, I guess, gutted and turned into a sort of a further living room or sort of an office, if you will. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Lena is currently sort of standing nearby the standing desk. And she turns to see you and says, Ah, yes, Captain Murthrin, hello. Uh, have you reached your decision yet? Uh, decision is forthcoming. We're waiting on the survey from the gas giant to see the viability of mining helium. Oh. Uh, no, uh, I am actually here a little sooner than I would have liked, honestly, but uh, circumstances would have required me to fast track at level. I'm not sure how aware you are, but um, we have a large contingent of a species called Bajoran on our ships. I see. And I see. So have they uh, approached you at all yet? Well, I am not familiar with what a Bajoran might look like. Uh, could you tell me what their distinctive features might be? Uh, ridges on the nose often with jewellery on the left ear, otherwise more or less humanoid. I do believe I saw one in fancy robes uh, during my constitutional walk earlier, but uh, no, none of them have approached me particularly. Uh, your security has made sure that I have gone unmolested during my time here. Yes, uh, so the fancy individual in robes is actually part of the reason I'm here to talk. So... Oh, just a second. Cat up again. So, uh, the Orb of Transition that uh, brought your people here to, here to this planet. It is not the first such orb that Starfleet has encountered. Uh, in fact, these orbs, most of the ones discovered so far, are considered religious artifacts of the Bajoran culture. They call them the Tears of the Prophets. Uh, the Prophets being the higher dimensional aliens that reside within the wormhole which flung us out here. I see. This 
I suppose this is a uh, interesting revelation. You mean to say mm-hmm. that these prophets might be why you're here in the first place? Potentially. But uh, they are very definitely a cent- central part of the Bajoran culture, doubly so since we actually know they exist. And uh, let's just say that the rumors of an orb on a pla- on the planet that we just happen to be thrown next to on exiting the wormhole has, um, well, it's sparked something of an interest in pilgrimage. Pilgrimage? Hmm. Are these pilgrims aware that the orb is not something that we simply share with outsiders? I'm afraid... I'm afraid not, really. That's why I am bringing this up with you. I have told them that uh, Starfleet will not be making access to the orb a contingent of any negotiations, and that any and all access to the orb will have to be negotiated with the Marissa directly. So I am here to let you know and pass on this information to your higher-ups. I see. I will, of course, impart this uh, information that you have just told me to the Queen and the other handmaidens. Uh, however, I do not believe we will have an issue turning them down if need be. Hmm. Of course. Yeah, sort of like nod, nods and understanding. Of course. Uh, should we prove to be a more permanent stay for you, I suppose... And of course, I do not speak for my queen, but I personally think that there could be in time a way for the Bajorans to see the orb. Hopefully, patience will win out. Very well. Uh, That was all. Uh, We should be getting the results of the survey back within within the next day or so. And uh, once we do, we will be able to give you an answer of whether or not we can commit to the, uh, we can commit to the station. Very well. Thank you so much. Yep. And Merthron will sort of leave, and once the doors are closed, he'll sort of pinch the bridge of his nose, because he already knows how the Vedic's going to respond to this. Mm-hmm. And we'll say, for sake of argument, uh, you head back up onto the bridge... Uh, by now, I would say that, Rizazo, you have returned from your earlier adventure. Uh, you have not told anyone about that yet, so that's going to be even more fun for Mirthrin. Uh The only one of the bridge crew that is not norm- or that is normally present that is not is Commander Gorteg. Uh, Commander Gorteg is currently doing laps of the ship with his family, uh, but he is available if you call on him, but since Beckett isn't here, it's just an easy way for him to, you know, not be present. So I, I, I walk back onto the bridge. Ah, oh, nice to meet you, Captain. I have something to report. Suddenly Irish. Yeah, suddenly, a, uh, suddenly an what? Irish horda. I, I tap my vocal communicator. Ah, oh, must have been damaged in the incident. I seem to be having a little bit of problems. Can everyone understand me? Am I still speaking in, uh, was it English? <laughs> yes, continue. That's, we have a bit of a problem with the uh, the with the Olean. He broke out and tried to attack the warp reactor. Took a couple security people down. No casualties, but a few stunned. And uh, a little bit of radiation seems to have hit my vocal uh, communicator. It's... it's uh, I can't tell the difference because I don't communicate by sound. It, it, I, 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 yeah. I, I, do you understand me? Ah, uh, yes, your uh, inflections are just uh, a little oh. different. Feel free to get a replacement synthesized as, uh, as soon as you get an opportunity. All right, uh, that'll be a Can you run that by me again, though? Did you say the Tholian though. got out? Oh, yes, the, the, the Tholian commander. He uh, broke it out of his cell somehow. We're going to have to reevaluate the rig situation, and we might have to move him to someplace else. Hmm. My robotic arm keeps tapping in the... Little uh, little box that's on on my Petholian rocky exterior, hoping it'll jigger it and cause it to stop oh, sounding. It would be so much easier if we actually knew how to put a Tholian in stasis. 
Well, I still recommend that we flood the corridors or lower the temperature of the corridors surrounding this, the brig. And maybe we could take him out of his suit if we raise the temperature of the brig itself. He might be a little less willing to run around and be barmy if he uh, if he knows he's going to freeze if he steps outside mm. the hall. Yeah, not too keen on trying to forcibly break a Tholian out of his suit, though. Uh, <clears throat> well, keep the guard up and uh, maybe have some uh, containment force fields on standby ready to drop as soon as the brig fails. Right. Well, it's also not a solution, but um, we could actually... I could remove this. I'm not an engineer. Obviously, or I'd fix my vocal and just... But... Uh, I could be the one who takes him out of a suit because we could raise the temperature up uh, to my tolerance, limits of my tolerance before we crack him open. That should be, make it a little easier for uh, the uh, transition. That way we won't have to have anyone in a in an exo suit uh, cracking it. Mm. <clears throat> mm. Now we'll save that as a last resort if he tries to escape again. Hi, Captain. Uh, any word back on the uh, Gastron survey yet? Uh, so, Ensign Hamasi, your Cation science officer, says, uh, Yes, sir. Uh, it's about as good as we can hope, sir. Uh, there is uh, rich deposits of helium-3. It should be fairly easy to harvest, and there's quite a lot of it to go around, sir. Hmm. So, all that's left is to decide what we do. And, uh, like, unless an emergency immediately sort of comes up to distract him, I guess he'll have to sort of go into his radio room and make a decision. All right. And I think this is the perfect opportunity to take a break. So, uh, let's take a uh, five to ten minute break and be back here at that time. And remember, I do keep the stream up. Uh, hopefully the beeps come through, so uh, those of you listening on audio know when we're back. But yeah, BRB. All right, I am back. Uh, Prayer, did you get your uh, audio thing figured out? Sorry, who was that? Uh, if Prayer had gotten his uh, his audio things uh, sorted out, and I guess he's muted, so he might not even be here right now. I'm back. Oh, welcome back. Uh, I'm assuming you got your sound thing figured out. I think so. It's been roboting a little bit here and there, and I have no idea why. Hmm. Let me uh, let me see what server we're on at the moment. See if I can switch servers to make it a little easier. 
yeah, let me uh, switch servers real fast, see if that fixes things. Okay, we should now be on US West. All right, we'll see if that works. It was just weird, like, people would cut out for a minute and then be back. I'm like, okay. Hmm. We didn't, uh, I don't think we lost anyone, did we? I don't think so. Got about six minutes to kill. Oh, uh, Bishop, are you still here? Yes, I am. Um, when we come back from the break, do you want to have time in your ready room to yourself, or do you want to initially go to, or not initially, do you want to just cut to the next captain's meeting where you tell everyone your decision? Probably the next captain's meeting. Okay. That was a, in character, out of character, I have decided. Okay. Then we will prayerfully put you guys on that map. Welcome back. Welcome back. I think the only one... I, I heard Jester earlier, but I don't know if he's still here. I am lurking. Okay, cool. Well, then let's, let's just go ahead and get back into it. Alright, so put us back on the screen. Okay. So, uh, we cut to perhaps half a day later. Uh, all of you have uh, had a chance to go back to your ships, get a Get a feel for your own crew's uh, attitudes towards uh, this whole scenario. Uh, but you have once again gathered in the Amalthea Senior Staff Conference Room. And once again, Cam is uh, ready to take notes and will be broadcasting uh, them to the fleet whenever Mirthrin deems fit. But yeah, you know, Mirthrin, really it's your meeting. Personalize our chairs in this table. Maybe a, a, a logo in the back of our chairs. That might be interesting. Mm, we'll step. put that down below finding somewhere to offload the Romulans on the priority list. That, that said, I have reached my decision. We will be building the station and basing ourselves around Swaytha for the foreseeable future as we repair the fleet. We will be trading uh, helium and potentially some knowledge, especially what data we've gathered on the caretakers with the Marissa. As we get the fleet back into a semblance of working order and find somewhere to store our 200 something unruly Romulans and Tholian as well out of character because i didn't notice it until just now uh, it's 500 romulans not too much 500 yeah the station will be a stopgap measure for certain but it is a stopgap measure that we need as we reorient ourselves and while we will event of course eventually have to leave the marissa to their fate as we make our way home we can at least give them as good a head start as we can at the end of the day, Starfleet, uh, Starfleet helps people who call for their help. And I don't think that should change just because we're in need. So Hylong speaks up. Hylong uh, actually does a very, you know, like a you know, nice clap, even if it's just her. And she says, well done indeed, Captain. Of course, I do not speak for Captain Beckett on this matter. I'm sure he has his own opinion, but... I think he would agree with what you have just said. These people are in a unique situation, and we are uniquely qualified to solve it. Are we, Master Chief? Are we uniquely qualified? Our, our fleet is in disarray. We are burgeoning at the seams with, with breaches. And you have co committed re valuable resources to help a 
primitive civilization that, as you have admitted, the solution is hardly one as it will quickly become irrelevant once they leave the system. I, I do question the decision as well. We, we do need to get home, and we cannot stop for days, weeks, months, years, every planet along the way, fixing their problems and dealing with every foreign power we've come across. While well, it is the Starfleet mandate to help species and citizens that are in distress, our first and foremost thought must be to our crew. Hello. To support the um, captain's decision, should we actually give you the rank of Commodore temporarily during these meetings to reflect the fact that you're the captain of captains? Anyway, aside the point, uh, the orb of space is actually one of our better chances of getting home. So spending a little bit of extra time investigating that while we build the station might still prove fruitful. And you base this better chance on what exactly, Captain? Hope, faith, the fact that the orb of time could be used to move throughout time, and this one can clearly move through space at least once. Clearly, that is not something we have found to be true. It's speculation. As for hope, hope is merely an attempt to impart meaning on a universe that is completely irrelevant, uh, completely unconcerned with our existence. It is a concept created to placate fears. It is well, But at the task of placating the- fears, it is extremely powerful. I agree with you that uh, we cannot make our way back to the wormhole being good Samaritans all the way, but uh, the simple fact of the matter is we need help. And the Marissa can help us as much as we can help them. I tend to agree with you, Captain. Even Janeway being stranded in the Delta Quadrant uh, found allies along the way to assist. And uh, relevant to that, uh, we are not currently in a position where we have to deal with Kazon. Although, uh, honestly, between the Kazon and the Caretakers, I'm not sure which one I'd rather take. Mm, Be that as it may. A little bit more manageable of a threat, at least. Be that as it may. Our fleet is, well, not quite in disarray, but we have more problems to deal with than we can handle on our own. And honestly, I feel that striking out into uncharted space, not knowing what's out there, uh, could be just as foolhardy and dangerous as staying here and defending the Marissa as they get a foothold. And at least this way we have a better chance of getting the fleet up and running. It's better to combat adversaries at full strength than trying to forge ahead at half strength. And uh, no man or fleet is an island. Captain, I do not begrudge you the decisions that you have made or the difficulty in in making them. However, However, I do believe you have not given ample thought to alternatives, and you have hastily made this decision. I'm letting you now that I am formally logging my protest to this decision in my log. Should we ever reach Starfleet or the Federation again, I will submit it. Duly noted, and your objection is noted for the record. Captain. Pinnack. Oh, uh, not me. Yes. It's strange that there are parallels to when Vulcans first encountered Earth. Could have passed them by. But without them, we wouldn't have a Federation. I do also remember that sort of smirks and says, I wasn't going to bring that up, but... I believe the Vulcan survey ship you are referring to stopped to monitor the 
presence of a warp-capable vessel, which was at the time a prerequisite for making contact with other species. Uh, such an event has not happened here, so we have come across the mercy by happenstance, and as such have been flung into their own problems. And it should also be noted that the Vulcan survey ship stopped to investigate the humans, and then proceeded to stay and help them for the next hundred years. This is true, however. You are implying that helping the MRSA somehow will advance our own um, progress down the line, perhaps, in the form of aid. And though I agree that their deposits of tritanium are quite helpful, it is not beyond our own means to come across our own deposits on other planets. The space is quite packed with resources, Captain, if you are willing to look. I believe you have committed us to this hastily. We also still have to deal with the caretakers. They have not been dealt with. Eventually, when we leave this system, they will still be there. And to that end, I'd like to establish a contingent of our scientists to work on finding an alternative method of dealing with them. You mentioned uh, p the potential of uh, electronic warfare to, re to mess with their programming. I'd like to put some more work into that, see if we can find some way to create an exploitable blind spot in their sensors. I suggest we look deeper at the drone that we have captured in order to study its programming. On that, that front, I think, is our best chance of dealing with them, why, you know, with a very efficacious wide effect. As um, ad characters at the Red November that's got all the electronic -y... Specializations? So. Yep. Right. Do we still have Assign... the... Oh. Question. Question for the GM. Uh, do mm -hmm. we still have, like, what's the state of the Romulan Warburg? Are we still, so, like, going around? And... It's more or less a flying hulk at the moment. There's just enough systems working to keep the 500 Romulans alive. They're definitely not happy about their current situation because you've got them packed into, the, into their own cargo bays, but... Uh, let's just say it's not warping anywhere, it barely has maneuvering thrusters remaining, and the cloaking device has also been removed. So, um, uh, also, also the weapons. Though. Also the weapons, yeah. Yeah. Um, one possibility is the Romulan Warbird, which would make a lovely distraction target for them. But its power source is also an artificial quantum singularity. If that could be overloaded after drawing several of the drones nearby, that would suck them in and destroy them quite nicely, and would quite possibly disable the the various bases. I hate to be this way, but I have to disagree with your 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 assessment again, Captain. You, you could I'm with Pinnick on this one. Uh, simple explosives are not the way to deal with this problem. You cannot guarantee you would bring in a large contingent of the caretakers. And considering their ability to replicate, they could recoup these lost numbers quite effectively. And we would be losing the, the ship, the Romulan ship itself, which is a valuable resource as we are low on, re on, on breach uh, repair. Uh, and in fact, we're, I'm thinking perhaps we might be able to sort of reseal it up and convert it into something of a floating prison to keep the Romulans on, as a poor taste as that would be. Well, we could do that with a different reactor in part of the station. We could then just remove its reactor, which would get a warp capability, and then use that as a weapon, which would... An explosive is not a very effective means of um, defeating these drones because they can take the pieces and remnants and use them to make more. An implosive, such as singularity, would remove the materials from use. Uh, there's a bigger problem here, though, and that is we're assume you're assuming that uh, these caretakers represent the sum total of their forces. For all we know, the caretakers are spread from here to the wormhole. I think, Captains, we can agree that we must learn more about them. We are lacking in information when it comes to the caretakers. What are their mm -hmm. motives? What are their methods? Where are they based? These are questions we definitely need answers to in order to move further 
forward with dealing with them. Uh, may I suggest uh, recon missions into their territory, Captain? Yes, sir. Uh, if we are going to be based here for the foreseeable future, it is definitely in our interest to get a solid grasp of what the local starscape is. So, uh, the Red November, I suggest we task with the job of dissecting the caretaker drone and figuring out as much as we can from it. In the meantime, one of the other ships should begin a deep survey mission of the surrounding stars, potentially finding a place for to base the Romulans permanently, or other resources for us to mine into for repairs. We will need to find other resources, Captain. As you've committed the very important sensor suite to this station, that suite was going towards repairing the Amalthea, and is composed of highly delicate materials that are not replicable, and are not, I believe, not currently found on the Marissa home world. Indeed. So Highlong speaks up and says, I believe that Beckett will more than happily volunteer to use the Lysithia and my expertise to find us additional sources of uh, resources, so we need not worry about that, but uh, perhaps we should uh, focus more on what to do about this station. Uh, we are building it, yes, but uh, you remember the mention of Dragon Squad uh, in an earlier meeting, yes? I yes. had a chance to talk with uh, Lieutenant Vinleth, and they have some rather interesting ideas that I think you'll want to hear about the station. Interesting. Well, let's uh, bring. Let's uh, hear what they have to say when they've got some time. Well, they are on standby. We need these. Need simply uh, call them into the room. And that's what will sort of indicate for them to come in. All right. So uh, when the door opens, uh, in steps uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Vinleth, and for the benefit of those who don't have a visual, uh, she is much like Kai Long, a Serato Draco. Uh, she has the characteristic horns and the sort of fin-like ears that protrude out. Uh, like most Serato Draco, her hair is very long and styled. Uh, but was what, ah, what is most important is the fact that she is wearing command red and that she is, of course, a lieutenant junior grade. And when she walks in, she is holding uh, two pads. And she says, uh, thank you for meeting with me, captains. I hope I am not intruding on anything too important. Oh, only the future. Uh, oh, only the decisions that will affect the future of the entire fleet for the foreseeable future. But continue. Well, I actually have information. I believe you will want to know. Uh, so she goes over to the screen behind Panek and she begins keying in information. And I'm gonna basically start enabling sheets for you guys to see. So uh, the first thing that shows up is uh, the following character sheet, or schematics for in-game terms. Uh, so she shows the following schematic, and she says, this is the base class two station. Now keep in mind that at the moment, uh, this is without applying any sort of mission profile uh, to the starbase. And there are several options uh, to what we could do with the station. And I will show you guys this handout. Uh, the first option is a diplomatic one. I think it pretty much goes without saying that a, a diplomatic-focused uh, station is obviously going to have diplomatic suites and uh, things of that nature. Uh, option two is uh, a firebase. Again, very self-explanatory. It would be a uh, very much a stronghold of our own, as it were. Then, uh, Package 3, uh, also self-explanatory, it would be a scientific-slash-repair-focused facility. It would help us get our fleet back up and running in a much quicker fashion. And finally, we have uh, the package that my team has been working on, that uh, Dragon Squad has been working on. Uh, it is the Midas Array Package. Mm. Um, Earthen will sort of sit up at that. I thought we were going to have to cannibalize the Midas Array functionality in order to get the station running. Well, uh, that is sort of the catch-22, I believe is the human expression. 
in order to significantly replicate the Midas array here in the Gamma Quadrant, we are going to need to cannibalize some of the, shall we say, resources allocated for station defense. Yes, thus leaving the fleet to take up the slack. Not necessarily. Uh, as you can see, the station is a powerhouse even at its minimal of security. Uh, it is maybe not as powerful as, say, a uh, Jupiter-class vessel. And she motions around at the uh, Amalthea. Uh, but it is certainly a force to be reckoned with all the same. Hmm. And we are planning to go the route of hiding rather than outright fighting. Hmm. Yeah. Out of character, does anyone have any uh, particular preferences? I, I'm I'm leaning towards either the Midas Array or the Repair Dot. That's yeah. how I'm leaning. Yeah. Um, then we If we if we're setting up a a sensor scrambler with this thing, how effective is that plus one to communication systems really going to be? I mean, well, I there would be some say form that... of interference. I would say anything that involves the sensor net you're going to put around the planet will be relying on the communication system. Right. So if we want that to be... System, yeah. yeah, if we want that to be as effective as possible, we should probably go with the Midas, right? But I'm kind of also leading towards the enhanced defense grid, just in case. I mean... Mm. We, 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 we can't rely on that sensor net forever. It could go down at some point which could, you know, maybe a malfunction happens, yeah, and suddenly the caretakers are swarming into the system. But at that point, mm -hmm. this enhanced defense grid is only going to help so much. Avoidance is probably better. Yeah, a scientific repair is nice, but that's a short-term gain. Repairing the ships mm -hmm. for a long-term loss. Diplomatic, mm -hmm. I don't see useful here. We're not Babylon 5. So yeah, I think it's... <laughs> Firebase is handy, but I think just avoiding a fight is better. And plus, you could justify the idea of Midas Array calling home and going back for Starfleet. I, I called dibs on playing Londo. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm hearing Midas Array, probably? Yeah. Yeah, I'll second, third that. Alrighty, Midas okay. Array it is. So back in character. Mm -hmm. Uh... Hmm. Well, uh, the possibility to at least contact Starfleet and let them know we're still a we're still alive would be useful. And the extra commu the extra communication systems would probably be useful. So unless, unless anyone has, oh, oh, sorry, no, you go ahead. Unless anyone has any objections. So Vinleth does speak up, and she says, "Uh." It sounds like this is what you're going with, but it would be remiss of me not to tell you that uh, this would not be a sure thing to start off with. Um, the hyper uh, the hyper subspace technology uh, does come with a small drawback. While it does enable us to communicate over longer distances in order to reach the alpha quadrant, we will need to find a similar gravimetric eddy or disturbance such as a pulsar or a singularity to reach back to the alpha quadrant such uh, as a romulan quantum singularity possibly sir uh however uh i reference more a a larger singularity a, a naturally occurring singularity um we would need to study the surrounding area to see if one exists but the fact of the matter is uh the other option we have before us uh, that ties into uh, what I'm about to say next is if we are able to contact Starfleet and otherwise have them direct the Midas Array in this direction, we would not need to rely on finding our own singularity. We could use the existing one and use our Midas Array to maintain what could be constant contact with the Alpha Quadrant. Hmm. Well, Starfleet scientists are nothing if not resourceful. 
I would need to update my my XO on his attempts at creating a QSD capable shuttle in order to reach the wormhole and contact Starfleet in order for them to realign their array. Well, that's, that actually leads into what I have next, Captain. And uh, she sort of motions and pushes the display aside so it's on you know one side of the display. And on the, the new space, uh, she shows you the following. So she shows you uh, the schematics for what could be a gamma flyer. And I'll, I'll adjust the stream and all that in a moment. Um, but, uh, as, as she explains, uh, this is a slightly unor unorthodox design but we believe that by creating the unique circular pylons, the circular nacelles, that we will have better capability of tweaking and otherwise uh, manipulating our subspace bubble. And for QSD, that is paramount. Uh, we believe that this craft will be small enough to maintain QSD indefinitely. However, it does come with some drawbacks, but let's focus on something more important and she shows you much like the starbase she shows you that there are three options uh, option one very simple we rely on the pathfinding abilities of this vessel option two is if we want a little more gun power and option three is if we uh, would like to call upon shall we say the more stealth aspects of a smaller craft and of course if you have a additional idea, I would be happy to theorize it for you on the spot. All those in favor of package one? Raise his hand. Yeah, I think the that's kind of a... <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Actually. The improved warp drive, you know, because they're not going to be sitting here fighting people with inside QSD, you know? They're going to be... Your tacticals just right out. They're, but, they're jetting right past anything that needs to be fought. Although, the, the point of a QSD ship is that you don't need the improved warp drive. You have the QSD, so reconnaissance might also work as well, and helps you kind of uh, you know, avoid... We, 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 would we are kind yeah. of in need of some good surveying, so... Uh, package, package 1 or Package 3? Mm. I think yeah, yeah, Package 1 is good for like getting it back once, but after that, you need to kind of... It needs a purpose when it returns from its journey. And that might be reconnaissance, bopping around beta. Mm. All right, so I'm hearing package three. Yeah, package three. Package three, it is. Alrighty. All right. So uh, I just think I just think Pathfinder was a better option, though. You know, that con and improved warp drive. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. you're, uh, you're not wrong. Um, I will say that the benefit of Package 1, uh, even though it is not uh, the improved warp drive, um, might not seem like it's a good choice. Um, you do have to still drop out of QSD every once in a while. And oh, yeah. giving it improved warp drive would, not only from a mechanic standpoint, give it a better warp capability, but from a fluff perspective, would also allow it to... Uh, travel at higher speeds and otherwise uh, supersede any structural limitations, if that makes any sense. Plus, if it can actually get all the way back to the Alpha Quadrant, then there's always the potential for refitting. Correct. So, actually, I think you've talked me around. <laughs> so, package one. You're the you're the com Commodore. <laughs> For now. I mean, yes, but, you know, like, role-playing group here. I think clearly we should go on to a rotational system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have an anarcho-syndicalist system of good governance here. Somebody lobbing swords at you from a pond? Well, we do have a very nice ocean planet full of aquatic people. We could give one of them a similar term. True. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. Package one, Pathfinder. All right. So we're going to go with package one. Uh, so uh, add a character. I do have to tell you the cost of all this now that we've figured out uh, what you're building and how you're doing it. So obviously to build the station, you will be consuming all of your station parts. And I did look up construction times with the entire fleet. 
uh, doing their thing. So even with the Lysithia off, uh, exploring the surrounding space, and with the Red November focusing on uh, care tra- or caretaker matters, uh, it will take you about a month and a half to build the station. And that is like startup day one kind of a thing. Um, however, uh, the flyer, the Gamma flyer, will consume 10 small craft worth of parts and it will only take uh, anywhere between four to seven days to build because i looked it up and apparently they built the entire delta flyer in less than a week so i think you could probably manage the same feat here especially with a lot more people mm-hmm. all righty Okay. So, yep, so month and a half window of vulnerability while we get the sensor net set up. Mm-hmm. Is that a good idea? I mean, what if we split the uh, crews and half continue maintaining repairs on the fleet and the other half building the station? Because what, what if while we're building the station, the caretakers come in force and we we are still just as damaged as we are now? I would have to agree with Pinek. It's better to increase time by three or four weeks and have it done securely and safely rather than... Yeah, so, I mean, we can definitely take up the slack in terms of getting stuff to and from planet until the station's operational. And uh, the better shape we're in, the better shape the Marissa will be in long term. Okay. So, uh, we'll get to that in the moment, because uh, I do have uh, ways that we're going to handle the breaches. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure uh, you guys are okay with the spend for the flyer. Uh, you do have enough for 30 small craft at the moment. By building the flyer, you would go down to 20. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an acceptable yep. thing, I would think. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that. All right, so in character, the uh, the next thing that uh, Vinless says... says Um, So, sirs, while it is possible, theoretically, for the flyer to maintain QSD uh, perhaps indefinitely, the limiting factor is our stores of Benamite. Uh, That is sort of the tricky part. There is a theorized 1 to 20 light year ratio, which means we're looking at about a thousand light years worth of Benamite just to get to the wormhole, uh, which... uh, that just gets us to where the wormhole should terminate. It doesn't get us back. So, assuming the wormhole works, sirs, that's that's two thousand light years worth of benamite. Captain, the Ophion currently has eighteen hundred light years of QS uh, benamite available. Hmm. I believe the Mayon also carries contingents of it. We have uh, 3,600 light years worth of Benamite as well. So, a significant uh, commitment, but not the entire reserves. And considering we would be mostly maintaining our, our pace with the rest of the fleet, I believe the remaining amount, if we split it amongst our, if the Ophion and the Maywan uh, split the cost amongst them, would be adequate to respond to any emergencies. All right. All right. I'll earmark that uh, fuel for use once the fly is completed. Uh, of course, sir. Uh, however, I did also want to present the option we could attempt to go directly to Seoul. Uh, that would be a additional three day journey, and it would cost us uh, two point eight thousand, or two point eight. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, two thousand eight hundred. Two thousand eight hundred. Yeah. Uh, it would cost us that much just to get to Seoul. Again, that's not including the return trip, but uh, it is sort of a gamble. We we do not know the state of the wormhole. If you are able to make it through the wormhole, I do not see a reason to dr- directly travel to Seoul. Deep Space Nine is pretty much right there, and you could just well, establish I mean, contact the, with Starfleet. From- well, I mean, this is the thing: is we don't know for certain that the wormhole is even functional because who knows how much damage it suffered. Right, so it's we spend three thousand to get we have to send three thousand to get all the way to Earth directly, or we spend one thousand. Uh, well, like two thousand eight hundred one way, so five thousand six hundred all told to get to Seoul and back. 
Well, once they're too sold, they can uh, refuel with what is there in reserve. In That's a good point, actually. So, actually, yeah. So, 2,000 versus 2,800. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say actually go straight to Sol would probably be the better option then. And, and of course, once they're there, they can just tell them, hey, point the Midas array in this direction, and you'll get a call in about two months. And if the wormhole is still operational, they, they'll be back faster. Mm hmm. It is definitely a long haul. Um, plan however i think it's the safest bet to go to, to soul and then if the wormhole is operational great we have our path if it's not we know what we must do oh, yeah it would actually be really good to know for certain whether the wormhole's operational before we start the fleet striking out and until then we have a base of operations here very well so, uh, Lieutenant Vinleth, uh, feel free to start plotting a course for Sol. She smiles and says, I will get the rest of the squad on it immediately, sir. Uh, however, it's a I, Dragon I, Squad, I believe it was. It is indeed, sir. And I actually hold here, uh, and she walks over and hands you a pad. I have the official creation orders. I simply need a signature of a captain to make it formal. Hmm? And the rest all sort of... Um... That was a Beckett's ship that they were from, right? Uh, no, no, that my... would have been her. Uh, not hers. Uh, it would have been. Uh, God, what's his name? Sorry, uh, Tuzon. Tuzon. Uh, Tuzon. Yep. So Mercer will sort of take the pad and look over. Well, ha and hand the pad over. Well, your crew. And I sign it. I hereby create Lieutenant, the Dragon Squad. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And from the... Takes the pad back and hands it over. Congratulations. Thank you. And on behalf of Dragon Squad, we will not let you down. All right. So it's at this point that we're going to actually kind of cut to more of a... It's it's not quite housekeeping. It's more of a, a you know, a, a sort of catch up with the fleet. Um, so yep. I'm just going to put us on this map because that's where all the uh, starships are. And it's something pretty to look at. Uh, so, uh, what's going to happen is during the time it takes to construct the starbase, um, you all may repair one breach on every ship. Now, that said, I need to know where the breach's supplies are coming from. Oh, where are they coming from? They're all coming from the Ophion. <laughs> Just pirating that shit. Yeah, just, just so Panette can, like, twist the guilt knife in a yeah, little. Yeah, no, you guys are really wanting me to mutiny, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've got to get that character drama in. Come on, bring back evil Panette. Oh, God. <laughs> oh uh, it was a suggestion, but I got shot down, believe me. <laughs> Uh, Ophion is going to repair a, stru a, re a structure breach okay. and take it out of its 11 worth. Uh, yeah. Let me just remind myself where all the breaches on the Amalthia are. All on sensors all for sensors. the Amalthia. Yeah. Alright, so... Hmm. I'm always wondering whether it would make more sense for the Amalthia to just leave its sensors as they are for now and help repair one of the other ships. Or is this just one breach per ship? One breach per ship. I mean, if you want to, say, allocate that breach from the Amalthia to a different ship, you can. Um, but, you know, it does kind of help if you start repairing your sensors. Right. Oh, well. R breach the sensors, then. Okay. Uh, Ophion, I think, is it Ophion has structure and what was the other one? We've got a breach to the engine, structures, and comms. Hmm. Just a bit of an even spread. Uh, how many breaches left on structure for the Ophion? Uh, just one. I would say I then, would if say you that. used oh, yeah. the Amalthias to get rid of that one, you could theoretically MVAM again. Which would be nice. So, uh, what, what do you think? What do you think, Panek? As a sort of a consolation, sorry from Mirthrin for choosing the option you didn't like. You don't have to. You don't have to reimburse me for that. 
Uh, it's it's just a tactical matter if you if that's what if you want. Uh, yeah, no. T- yeah. Tactically, having the Ophion up and running soon uh, would be better because, like, the Amalfi is going to be vulnerable for quite and a while. Considering the uh, caretaker's penchant for massive amounts of ships so far and carriers, mm. and having the ability to split off might be uh, pretty good. Yep. Uh. Now, the Red November, was it just the weapons that were breached there? Mm-hmm. All right, so they're... But they're also installing oh, disruptors on them. Yeah. 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 That is ongoing. Uh, May 1 was... Just communications. Assistance. Communications. Just communications. And I feel like there's one more ship. The Red November? Uh, you're thinking the, of the Klingon vessel, the Bird of Prey. Oh, yes! What have they been doing? Well, they've been doing what good Klingon intelligence officers do. Be there, and you don't even know they're there. Hmm. Did we say the Lysistheus breaches uh, the computers and engines? Uh, no, I don't think we've brought up the Lysithia, so that's, that's probably what's missing. Uh, yes, yeah, so it has one breach to engines and two breaches to computers. And if I know... That's the engines? Or did uh, McCall have a uh, preference? Um, I think Beckett indicated he wants his engines back up. So we'll say that I his breach that. to engine goes away. And I will take that off of the supply list. Okay. Uh, so that's still three breaches that need to be accounted for. I can math today. One, two. Yeah, it is three. Uh, three breaches of of repair supplies that are going to either have to come from uh, the Ophion, or you're going to have to cannibalize the uh, the Benetta, the Warbird, and use its three breaches worth of supplies. Now, doing that to the Benetta will mean that you have the 500 Romulans now on the Amalthea itself. Oh, the Benetta. Oh, yes, that's right. The Romulans are currently on their ship. Yeah, correct. Oh, yeah. I, I think correct. keeping the Benetta functional as a place to keep people is for the best. How many breaches could we take a banana without having to pull people away? Could we like leave them like one breach with the supplies or is it two or does it have to be all I three? would say it would have to be all three at this point um, simply because if you take anything more from the ship uh, you start to run into power problems, you start to run into life support problems and it just spirals down from there. Yeah, no, let, let, Let's leave the banana functional. So, uh, just so we're all on the same page, uh, the Ophion is repairing two breaches to structure, which brings you down to nine breaches worth of repair supplies. Uh, the uh, Red November is repairing its, has already taken out its uh, requisite for its weapons. And the Mei Yuan uh, is it repairing a breach to its communications. Uh, assuming it's got the resources. It would have to take a worth of a breach of repair supplies from the Ophion, which would bring you down to eight. Uh, sounds good, I think. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, mark off that we have eight remaining, and of course tick off uh, the breaches that you have fixed. Uh, the right. next thing we need to figure out is uh, what uh, who's going to be paying the uh, 2,800 light years of QSD? Uh, probably the Amalthea, because we've got the largest store, right? Uh, no, no. maybe not in Ophion or what has them, or who has them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ophion will offer up half its con- uh, supply. Okay, so that's 900. And so the is the Amalthea just got the one the rest. communications breach fixed, or...? Uh, yeah, one the, last session. The uh, the uh, yeah, the May one should be at three breaches to communications after everything's repaired. Yeah, and the Amalthea is currently at four. Yeah. Uh, no, the Amalthea should be at uh, seven. Huh? One, two, three, four, five, six. At the moment, hang on. Well, there's. there's I think, six I think dots, it might have just so... disappeared off the edge. Yeah. There's, there's six dots, so we can only count up to on the sheet. We just have to remember that 
its scale breaches to the Amalthea to the sensors. Mm. Alright, so it's gone from 7 down to 6. Okay. So, doing the math here, uh, that means that the Benamite on the Maywan is now at 1700. So mark that off right, if you would. Off. And then, uh, once that's marked off, uh, I will say that we come to the point in the session where we can do one of a few things. Um, the first is that we simply skip ahead and uh, we just kind of cut to the station's launch, as it were. Uh, the alternative is that we have you guys pilot Dragon Squad. Now, Dragon wow. Squad is meant to be sort of a, a fourth crew for you guys to have fun with. Uh, but I don't want you guys to feel like I'm forcing them on you. Uh, they oh, will, they... of course, fly off to Seoul on their own. And hopefully we'll get back no problem. But if you wanted to sort of play out that journey a little bit, uh, we can certainly have you guys piloting Dragon Squad instead. Hmm. Choices, choices. I, you know, um, if I could throw out a suggestion. Sure. It's if we hold off launching the Gamma Flyer slash, uh, was it Slip Skimmer? I was joking about. Mm -hmm. And the station, we could say do something where we throw it out to chat to give us a name for that or your Patreon. It's not a bad idea. Um, hmm. I will say that we can certainly name it after the fact, um, but in order to get the Gamma Flyer, you know, out there and doing stuff, um, I don't think it's time, you know, I don't think there's enough time to, to ask chat for a name now, per se. Um, but for the uh, Starbase, well, definitely. But alternatively, because it's going to take a better part of a month or so to get the station up and running, and probably we're going to have some drama with the Vedic before then. Oh, yeah. Uh, but also the Lysithia would probably have been able to do a bit of surveying of a couple of planets by then. Mm -hmm. And it's also one of the things where we are down two players today, so if you guys wanted to do Dragon Squad, that was a nice sort of... You know, we can we can deal with them, and that way when uh, McCall and oh, Walker is this, is this back, for the end of the session, you mean? Well, it's not technically the end of the session. I mean, we still have about 30, 40 minutes. Um, but, you know, it, it would give uh, Beckett and uh, McCall uh, time to catch up uh, when we come True. back. And doing Dragon yeah, Squad man. doesn't necessarily preclude that we won't do RP in the interim with the rest of the things. It just means that they will be the focus for a time. Sort of like how uh, the Lysithia and the Ophion were for a little bit. Yeah. So again, it's entirely up to you guys whether we even use Dragon Squad, but I did want to make it an option. Hmm. So it's that, or what was the other one? Well, the other one is we kind of call the session here um, because I, you know, want to make sure we don't go too far ahead uh, for our missing players. <laughs> so it's entirely up to you guys. I, honestly, I'm actually okay with ending the session a little early. I've got to, like, do some stuff before work tonight. Okay. Or we could just open it up to some RP. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm open for any RP you guys want to take care of as well. Uh, maybe just do a little RP wrap up and then call it like half an hour early. Sure. All right. So, uh, who would like to go first then in matters of RP? Oh well, actually, uh, Mertrin will need to go visit Lena and let them know our decision. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh as the captain is making his way through the halls towards Lena's uh, room. Mm -hmm. uh, out of a turbo lift comes Freepok with a female ensign in each arm. And he goes, and then I punch the Romulan right in the face. And uh, then he sees the captain. He goes, oh, uh, um, captain? Engineer? Uh, good day. And then he kind of just backs into the turbo lift, taking the two of them with him, and then off he goes. <laughs> Have fun, I suppose. Anyway. So yeah. Uh, you uh, you find your way to the ambassador's quarters, and of course she lets you in no problem, and she says, I sense that you've made a decision, Captain. 
Yes. <clears throat> we will be establishing the station and engaging in trade with Marissa to get our fleet back up and running. Very well. I am pleased that this is the course of action that we have chosen. Rest assured, uh, the Marissa will make sure that our partnership is a two-way one. Mm. And uh, pro pro probably Mertrin doesn't have to actually say it for Lena to pick up that he's sort of preoccupied with how the situation with the Vedic is going to play out. Mm. Uh, well, Captain, I, I sense you have a lot on your mind. Uh, is there anything I might be able to assist with? I mean, honestly, there's not really much I can say that wouldn't uh, be considered unduly influencing your decision. I see. <sighs> yep, yeah, there's just an awkward silence. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I will say, though, the... Uh, from what I've heard, the humans on board are very excited to uh, hear about the history of the mythical city of Atlantis. I will make sure that one of our historians is brought up so that uh, your officers can uh, query them at their leisure. Mm. Well, here's to hoping that this is the start of something good. And she does that sort of nod with her head where you've picked up the fact that that means that she agrees and is happy with the situation. That method sort of mimics the gesture. All right, I will leave you to your work. Of course. All right. I'm guessing next guessing you want to see the Vedic? Uh, although if anyone else had anything to do before then. Sure. Uh, anyone else have something they'd like to handle? Um... Rosazzo would actually like to see Fryproc. Sure, where do you want to meet him? Uh, engineering or somewhere convenience. The tokens are probably there already. Yep. So yeah, uh, obviously not stream is not there, but yeah. Uh, we'll say that you find each other in engineering. Rosazzo walks up. Oh, excuse me, Chief. You seem to be having a little problem with my vocal inducer. Uh, I think I don't know. that match can translate. Karen kind of just doesn't pay attention to you at first. He's mumbling, you know, ah, oh, fix all those ships. Now build a space station. Now do do, do all of this. You know, figure it out. And he's like, what, 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 do you, what do you want? What do you... Excuse me. Uh, I seem to be sounding a lot different. Uh, since I don't actually have a sense of hearing, I have no idea what I sound like or what's being heard. But apparently everyone's looking at me like I'm a little bit Barney. And Freepok will give him a look like that where he's just... He's tilted his head and he's kind of open mouth, like looking at the Horda. I'll say, yeah. I, I guess you want me to fix this too? Yes, please, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, right, uh, fine. Hand me that tighter spanner. Reaches over the little robot arm. Uh, this is. Uh, hand me the two thirds. The two thirds one. <laughs> Alright, two thirds of what? <laughs> Uh, all right if you can, how do you use a spanner on a combat yeah it's he's it's gonna go tricky. over and flip it he's gonna like he's got like a uh a, the tool is called in real life is called a spooger and he's gonna like <laughs> stick it underneath the side and flip the panel on, on it up it's a, he's got like a little bit of a guitar pick there to pry it open i suppose right like mm -hmm. an apple device so, it, uh, these things need quite a bit of calibration because I don't speak through sound, but by. But you know, I uh, hear sound yeah. very delicately, yeah. and as you talk, it makes my job harder. <laughs> I can smell your irritation. Well, I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or not. That is how Hordas mostly communicate sound as a smell. What an unfortunate trait for your species. You smell very lovely. <laughs> uh, I, uh, let's get this fixed. This is, Thank uh, you. Yes. 
This, this is, is a very delicate procedure since it is translating my minute orders and then interpreting them into vocal interpretations. Calibrating these has taken a number of years. Right, and, right. Okay, and I'm just going to fix it willy-nilly here for you, right? I have the utmost confidence in you. So, this is going to be a difficulty three. Uh, we're going to call this a control and engineering. I'm going to just dump my threat for this session, <laughs> and uh, we're going to make that a difficulty four and a complication wow. range 16 to 20. All complications. I'm going to be speaking French the entire time. <laughs> you do have what, two what kind of task is this? Uh, this is a control engineering task, and I would is say that, that this is repair wrong? work. Uh. Uh, I'll use jury rig on this uh, to reduce the uh, difficulty by two. Okay, just be aware that uh, this does mean it will require regular updating from you if you jury rig. Yeah, I, I, I think those scenes will be very, very funny. Okay. This, this is daring what? Uh, it's control and engineering. All right. If you're dumping all your threat, then I'd like to dump all of our uh, remaining momentum. <laughs> Okay, so two will buy you one die. Uh, if you spend a momentum and a threat, that'll get you a th fourth die. So that was control engineering? Correct. Definitely have a... I have four dies now, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely got to focus. Very nice. Yeah, you repair the hell out of it. So I, you know, there's sparks. I've burned my finger a bit and sworn at the Horda, been apologized, and then uh, I slam the, the the case shut and say, "All right, take it first, Ben. Sing me something." Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello. <laughs> Don't Actually, quit your day job. What is singing? Ah. Uh, it, it's a it's a, it's a smell that makes you feel really good inside. That's that's what I hear. I, I've heard a lot of bad ones though. It's easier. Uh, that that is yes music. I, I'm vaguely familiar with the concept of music, but it is. I cannot sing any more than a blind person can paint. Okay, so that's a fun person. That's a horrible example. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be in working order now. Thank you. I appreciate your time and effort. Frank yeah, Frank. yeah. Everybody appreciates the engineer, right? Only when it's time to fix things. I will. I favor I owe you. In response, I'd be very careful about owing a Ferengi a favor. No take backs. <laughs> okay. Uh, agreed. Uh, do I shake something or <laughs> what is. What is what, how do we do this? Because he holds out his little robot arm. Uh, and I very delicately shake that. All right, I will leave you to your work and construction. All right. So, See the other way. Uh, with you guys doing that, uh, Preer, did any of your characters have something you wanted to handle? Preer's just looking into how to save the Admiral. Okay. Uh, I will say at this point, you've probably gone through the database about twice. And, you know, Trill are annoyingly secretive about the joining process. So you don't have a whole lot of data on it. Uh, what you're able to tell is that none of the treatments that you would normally have for organ rejection will work. Of course, can't just replace the symbiote. Yeah, and you can't just replace the symbiote. That's uh, that's kind of you know the tricky part. Uh, but as you know, we we can't have a sick base scene without a certain 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 ah, certain someone. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we should have just ended half an hour early. Why did we invoke the <laughs> Breath of Jensen? So, in walks Lieutenant Jensen. This time, he doesn't really walk in, but so much as he hobbles in. He's got like a makeshift crutch. His leg is twisted in a rod angle. He says, Doctor! I look up from my computer. What did you do? I was on the holodeck again. Dear Lord, man, am I going to have to revoke all holodeck activities for you? I, maybe. I feel like for your best life interest and for mine, it'd be a good idea. But how will I get my calisthenics in? Um, you know, I could probably ask our resident Klingons. Uh, Commander, Commander Gortag, uh, uh, on second thought, maybe I'm okay. And, and he turns and he's, he's clearly not okay, but he starts trying to hobble. <laughs> okay. Jensen, get over here. Uh, oh, okay. Just, just don't tell the Klingons. You do know I do a daily report. Oh. And he just kind of, that's all he says. He just goes, oh. All right, hop up on the table. Let's get you taken care of. What did you do now? All right, so uh, roll me a, uh, a reason medicine. Difficulty one. If it matters, you have uh, two momentum at the moment. Skull just chilling over there. Yeah, Skull chilling yeah. in cryo. Sure, I'll burn a th one of our momentum for a third die. Why not? Why not? I don't... Would emergency medicine count as a focus? I mean, technically... I, uh, See, sure, I'll let it apply. Why not? This is where you should have dumped all your threat. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, uh, you remember last session where there was that mysterious flu that was going through the entire uh, fleet? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, you called it early. Mr. Jensen here is the root cause of that. Jensen. Yes? Have you ever had Rigelian fever? Uh, when I was a kid. Well, I think I can blame you for my pain, my headache here recently. You oh? seem to be, you seem to be a carrier of it. And I've had an increased amount of uh, cases here lately. Uh, oh, I, so, but uh, oh, uh, is is there anything you can do to to stop that? I I don't want to get people sick. Well, let's see what I can do. At the very least, I think I'm going to give you a round of treatment. Okay, Doc. Whatever you think is best. And then after that, out of character, I have no idea how to keep him from carrying it um so i would just say that you would have to you know do a standard treatment on him but as long as you treat him he will no longer be a carrier it's right. uh I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's the the proper real world real ah, real world equivalent um it's sort of like chicken pox and and shingles where if you get chicken pox you have like a one in three chance of getting shingles later in life. But if you get the shingles vaccine, then you don't have to worry about it. So it's kind of the same scenario. Alrighty. I'm going to take um, several vials of blood from him before I give him the treatment just mm -hmm. to have um, for research purposes. Let's see if we can make a vaccine. Okay. Noted. All right, and then uh, what probably might be the final scene. Because uh, I imagine there aren't very many non-symptomatic carriers of Rigelian fever. Yeah, this is this is actually a very important discovery. Um, Congratulations, so, Jensen. You have again failed forward through life. Yep, that's what he does. Uh, so where are you going to be meeting the Vedic uh, there, uh, Mirthrin? Hmm. Uh, let's go with the Arboretum. 
the Arboretum. Alrighty, we haven't used that yet. This isn't really a sort of official captain meeting, and uh, the Arboretum's kind of neutral. It is, and either I'm not finding it in my list, or I don't have it in here. So we'll just go to Theater of the Mind. Uh, needless to say, the Arboretum uh, of the, the Amalthea is rather large, being a Jupiter class. Uh, it is uh, more than a few decks tall, and it takes up quite a quite a large chunk of uh, real estate that technically could be used for a lot of things, but having a, a green space such as this is uh, very beneficial to both morale and the overall mental health of your crew. And sure enough, uh, when you walk in and you find the Vedic uh, already there waiting for you. Uh, he's sort of uh, sitting on a bench looking over the small pond, or I guess it's more of a lake uh, that's in the Arboretum, and he doesn't even look at you as you approach, and he says, yeah. Ah, Captain Arthur, Arthur, like, hello. Comes up, stands behind the bench looking out of the lake as well. Have you made your decision yet there, Captain? Indeed I have. We will be staying around in orbit of Suetha for the foreseeable future. Very well. And what will become of myself and the other Bajorans who wish to make the pilgrimage down to the planet? Well, I do not have an answer for that, as that is left to the Marissa to decide. Yes, but I understand that you must have talked with them about this by now. Indeed I have. And? And Rathen sort of like thinks for a while before replying. They are not completely against the idea of allowing the Bajorans access to the orb. But uh, it will very definitely not be free access. As I'm sure you'll understand, the orb is as important to them as it is to you, if not more so. Well, it's progress nonetheless. I suppose the only thing I can ask is that you... I don't know, uh... Impress upon your followers the virtues of patience. I believe I can do that for the time being. Well, unless there is anything else you wish me to know, I shall leave you to your meditations. He just remains silent, and you get the sense that he's not necessarily giving you the cold shoulder, but he definitely thinks the conversation is over. Yep. So, Mazarin just turns and leaves. Alrighty. So, I think that's where we're going to end the session for this week. Uh, so players stick around for just a little bit longer, but to any watching on Twitch, YouTube, or listening on uh, iTunes or Podbean, uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see these guys next week. Bye-bye, all. Bye, all. Mm -hmm.